it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Smoke School of Art, an Atlanta-based nonprofit think tank and artist collective that addresses contemporary issues in art, culture, and philosophy. Smoke School builds communities through exhibitions, partnerships, lectures, critiques, and educational development. Established in 2009, Smoke School has exhibited at venues such as uh, Pinion Gallery in Miami, Tubman African American Museum in Georgia, Bariqua College in New York, the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta, and the, under, and, under, and the Underground in Atlanta. Smoke School also acts as a catalyst for post-formal schooling for artists where participation is free and open to the public, homework is given through social media, and classes held in weekly Friday night meetings. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Hitchinson, Eric Mason, Karina May, Julio Mejia, Michi Miko, Jason Sweet, and Jamel Wright Sr. of the Smoke School of Art. We want to applaud you because you brought us here. So at Smoke School, we say thank you to you. You guys did a wonderful job of selecting a fantastic collective. Welcome back to Moving the Center. As always, I'm your host, Carly Asset. Thanks for staying with us. In collaboration with the Smoke School of Art, a nonprofit art collective based in Atlanta, the Auburn Avenue Research Library recently hosted an engaging community lecture series on black art in America. In the last installment of the series, a conceptual artist and an educator Christopher Hutchinson examined some of the ways that racism manifests in the making and marketing of black art. Um, hopefully, this is an ongoing kind of partnership between this institution and this group. Um, so I want to mention that. Um, also, um, what was the other thing I was going to mention? Permanent collection. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Slow School of Art. The Slow School of Art Collective. All right, and we've been around since 2009. All right, and again, we thank you very much for uh, bringing us here. As mentioned before, we're an Atlanta-based nonprofit think tank that discusses and addresses contemporary philosophy and issues of modern art and culture. All right. Here's our, just a little, our mission statement. I'm not going to read it to you. I'll just take a minute for you to kind of go through it. You know, I am going to read it to you. <laughs> all right. Now, by the way, you're talking to all scholars up here, you know, and, and as loose as we may seem in our approach to communicate to you what Smoke School is about, you're going to find a number of you that are a year in, a semester in, you're in your last semester, you're going to be in an island after you're done. All right. And we've kind of, we'll, we'll address it later on. But at the end of the day, <laughs> this is our mission statement. And I'll get back to what I just stated here a second ago. But we assert that all modern art derives from Africa. All conceptual exercises derived and conceived in the ancient ceremonies of the Dogon. We are the noble savages that reside on the moon with rites of passage, shape-shifting through the universe. We truly believe and have special powers embedded in our pigment, hair, and bone. We have been indoctrined by grimy hip hop, and you can handle or you cannot handle our extra mosa. All right? And so, with that being said, I'm going to kind of go through the founders here. And here are our founders. We have Christopher Hutchinson on the far left, soon to be Dr. Eric Mason in the middle, and Michi Miko, who was, was unable to make it for personal um, obligations on the far right. And uh, with that being said, we'll have, as we'll, we're gonna get into Smoke School, but we'll have each individual here on the panel introduce themselves and talk about their work. And this is uh, Christopher Hutchinson. Hey. Uh, thank you for having us once again. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, the collective um, started in 2009 with myself, Eric Mason, Michi Miko. And you know, it did start as a response to being after graduate school. And yes, after graduate school, you will, you will miss it. You will miss the intellectual discourse and debate between your classmates. You will need to further that, right? Um, so. We can go more on that. You miss access. So yeah. after postgraduate school, access to your <coughs> colleagues, access to equipment, access to a critique, access to an opinion. It, it's tough, and you actually have access to a deadline. I mean, some of you may get gallery representation, some of you may have an opportunity to do shows, but still, th those grades push those deadlines. Those professors push those deadlines, so those expectations change. And as an artist, I began to change because I didn't have those expectations. Right, I mean, so it started with, it started with one searching out and finding out, you know, what truly Atlanta has to offer. So myself, Eric, and um, Michi, every Friday we would go to every gallery that was posted. We and called it. We called it hidden spots. Hidden spots. So we would go hit all the <laughs> spots that had art. Exactly, and you know, I would text pretty much everybody that that I knew as an artist. Let's go check out this space. Is this space relevant? You know, is the work good? Right. And then we'd have a conversation about the work. Exactly. What did you like tonight? What did you see tonight? It's similar to a critique. So when you guys put your work on the wall or you show a video or you have a sculpture, you ask your colleagues, what do you think? What do you think of the work? Right. So we, we would do a critique every Friday on what we saw in, in local Atlanta or wherever we travel to. Right. And, you know, whether or not our work fit in that space. Right. And a lot of, even though we are an Atlanta-based collective, the majority of us are transplanted, right? So, um, yeah, and Atlanta definitely has a style, if you will. So um, we, we were really trying to figure out where we fit in, what, who should we connect with, and all, all of that, right? So the list kind of started out with like 30, 40 people that I would send texts to, hey, we're going to check out 
this spot tonight, right? And um, after that, we would, you know, smoke a cigar, smoke whatever, and um, we would discuss until probably, you know, two, three in the morning, right? Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer. <laughs> In you know rain, sleet, and snow. A lot of times we caught Eric out there real, real cold. It'd be cold. <laughs> <laughs> we, right. call, we call that holding court. Right. So it would be purely conversation about art, though. Right. So it not not just shucking and jiving, not 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 uh, barbershop talk, none of that kind of stuff. We would be talking high level art, theory and application. Yeah. Right. So not just. Um, not just reading, but theory and application. And, and that's how it started. It started very informally. It started just, we're going to hit these spots, and um, we're going to hit these spots, and then we're going to talk about it. Then it, became, then it became official, official, if you will, right? Where, OK, we're meeting. We're talking every week. What are we going to do about this, right? You and know? it was kind of during the gallery off season. There you go. And we started to implement homework. We started to implement a focus for the group. So outside of just looking at art, when we didn't have the opportunity to look at art, we came up with a topic and we would discuss that topic and relate it sometimes to what we saw that week if we saw anything that week. Absolutely, mandatory homework, right? So even if the, the homework itself didn't necessarily apply to your work, well, how could it, how could it apply to your work, right? So we're, we're literally having very um, <laughs> intimate, conversations about your work and the relevancy of it, right? Um, so the homeworks began, right? And the homeworks kind of, um, well, they, yeah. yeah, they became really important. They became the backbone, backbone of the group. Right. Because the homework kept us intellectual. They kept us relevant to each other. They kept us focused. Because a, a group of people can always come together and lose focus. It's hard to move a group of people. Absolutely. But if we have a homework, then we always have a focus. And Chris is very good at bringing it back to the homework. Always. And usually, usually when we come together, you know, we'll talk a little bit, everybody will get familiar. Right. And then we'll set it off. Who wants to set it off? Who wants to talk about the homework first? And that's when it becomes intellectual. Usually, if it's your first time at Smoke School, you then set it off. you start it off. You spark it. You spark the homework, right? And that's your introduction <laughs> into Smoke yeah, School, yeah. right? And now we, we really welcome all types of dialogue. And really prove your point. That's, that's really, or that's one of the main bases behind Smoke School, is prove your point. Um, one of our phrases is, talk with your chest. Yeah. Say it with your chest. Say it with your chest. Right, nah, don't back down. Um, and when you do get challenged, we'll give you the time. Take the time you need to, you know, <laughs> argue <laughs> your point. And um, yeah, get it out there. Is that what you wanna talk about, the curse words came from? Ah. <laughs> So the curse words came from an the curse words in the presentation. <laughs> in the presentation. Yeah. Came from an evening of um a, a matter of fact Marvin was there that evening. <laughs> he he she, technically he should be on that video as well. Exactly. He he had some choice words for the gentleman as well. <laughs> <laughs> now um We was at the goat farm. We were at the goat farm, we were at this large table and we all meeting and we're discussing um but this young gentleman came. Hold on one second. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I had a studio in the Gold Farm, which I no longer have because of that conversation. I just started <laughs> throwing that. That's true. That's true. And <laughs> that's a, that, that is a very important part. We, our, our conversation and our dialogue does get shh. We don't stay. Incredibly honest. <laughs> we don't stay in one place very long, except now we're at my place. so. We're good, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that young gentleman had the idea that um, what he should do was he should create artwork that fit the mold of Western art world, <laughs> of the Western art world, and after he's made a success for himself, that 30 years later, he would magically change and become honest again. By the way, he was African. Yeah, he was from Liberia. He, he was, was Liberia. He, yeah. Uh, a Liberian born and bred guy <laughs> saying this, right? And he'd been ple pleading his case for about an hour and a half. And it really just reached its point of um, really wasting our intellectual dialogue, which we were having uh, about. So anyway, one of the tenets of um, this group is be honest. Be honest. Be honest with your work. 
Be honest up with who you are, what you're trying to say. An attempt, any attempt to try and code and subvert. Not that your work needs to be overt. No, it doesn't need to be overt and in your face. No, but never back down. Never backpedal. Never try to make your work fit somewhere and have it because it's, one is sad. It's sad. You're you're paying all this money to become a master of art. You should master your art, honestly. So a lot of our um, discussions, when you hear that intensity or that, or that passion comes from that, comes from when that is not present. When that honesty isn't present, then yes, you, will, you would hear a lot of expletives. <laughs> <laughs> Making money doesn't determine right. how, if someone's honest or not either. You know? So you know, just, you know, Nike's a good running shoe, that doesn't make them the best running shoe. And I, I believe that honestly, that, that's what they try to do. They try to, they lure you with the money and then you gradually begin to compromise who you really are. And then before you know it, you have like 20 people painting for you and you got this huge studio and you're, um, you're selling paintings to Spike Lee and vodka companies. And <laughs> I'm speaking about one person in particular, but I'm trying to code it. But the thing don't, is, don't is code be honest. Be honest. <laughs> Um, there. Are, Why are you making fun of me? I'm not making fun of you as Kahindi Wally, but I mean, anyway. But the thing is, like, we're about, it's about being completely honest. And on that night, the guy was just going on and on about 30 different ways on how he was going to code his work. So therefore, and then one day after being so far into the system that eventually he was just going to magically start doing his own work. And the thing is, like, you can't, there's no way that you can ever be considered an artist at that point if you switch up your work in that way. If you evolve in your work, that's one thing. But when you switch up and say, oh, this is who I really am, then who you been for the past 30 years? Right, right. So yes, we, we advocate honesty, right? And, the, and, you're, and not that you need to agree. You don't need to agree. That's not the, everyone here is an individual and pursue their own path, right? Um, the collective is a collective of individuals that, no, we're not carbon copies. I think the only thing that we basically agree on is honesty, right? And small school. You want, you want to get in on that, Karina? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a true girl. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, we have, this is a, now doctor, about to be doctor, but MFA photographer, MFA painter, world-class painter, abstract painter. Big guy. <laughs> light skin. <laughs> right. Oh, oh man, painter, sculptor, absolutely, right? Art historian. Art historian. Karina, dopest sculptor you're gonna see, <laughs> right? Sweet sculptor. But the point is, where we meet, where we meet and where we, um, the, the crossover is, hey, you know, does this match up with what you really want to do? And, you know, that's, that's what you really miss when you get out of grad school. What you, meet, what you really miss is, is that type of dialogue. So in short, we, we developed this collective to keep our grad school situation alive, so to speak, without the school, without the classes and all that. But, kind of keeps us alive, it keeps us thinking, it keeps us working to learn, it keeps us Sharpening. discussing new topics, it keeps us influencing others, it, uh, it keeps us making work. And understand that <laughs> that commitment that we've made, every, a weekly commitment, you know, sometimes we'll have it on Christmas. <laughs> yeah. We, we've had it on Christmas. The weekly commitment is, is difficult, and that's why you see the number that you see here now, right? is um, many artists say that, hey, you know, I'm an artist, whatever. It's, it's work, it's work. It's work to be, to be honest. And when we started, I mean, when we had like, our first quote unquote photograph, we had like, like 15 members. But these are the members that you see today. The only one that's missing here is Michi. Carla. 
Carla. Carla. Carla. So there's only two of us missing. So out of those 15, this is what you're seeing. Because it takes that commitment. It takes that, um, it takes coming to small school. It takes come doing the homework. It takes being critiqued on a regular basis. Um, and not just your work, but what you say, how you present your work, how you do your artist yeah. statement. All that stuff is part of being part of smoke school. And, and believe me, those simple things that you're hearing, things that you're doing every day in class, are things that we judge our, ourselves on. And those people could not, are not willing to do that, so therefore they're not here. Julio wants to say a word. I do. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody here have any questions of what was just said? So far. So far? Good question. I, uh, yeah, good question. I was going to actually get, get into that through, through probing question. But even before addressing that directly, something um, that's important to under, can be important to understand is that the artwork that, at least from my perspective, the artwork that someone does is beyond yourself. And, and what I mean by that is if, if, for example, you make a work of art, you sell it, it's no longer yours. It's beyond you. You have to let go, right? You continue, you continue to do artwork through your whole you know, chronological life. You're dead, you're gone. Right? But your existence of what you left behind is there. And that speaks for something beyond you. It speaks for your time and place in that moment of history. And now that then begins to break down into your moment of history to yourself, your moment of history to culture, your moment of history into social aspects, your moment of history into anthropological aspects. You know, that, and then so from a collective, from my standpoint, is that and, and the way at least I, I approach my work is that I begin to think about those things beyond myself. And so as a collective, as we're studying, we're studying all those aspects that come into the homework. Who's, even, who's either living now or living in the past? What, what culture said is the, is the correct rubric for artistic design and aesthetics? which culture and, and uh, society says, which is the appropriate way for spiritual connections to the artwork. So these are things that we engage, you know, from a global perspective, but also from the as aspect of what was mentioned in, in our mission statement, that we believe that the origins of modern art is African, point blank. And there's no shying away from that, okay? But with that being said, <laughs> with that being said, to still answer your question, okay? Then that goes into as we educate our each one teach one, right? Michi Miko, that's one of you know that, that that's, can be a cliche statement, but there's something very pure about that. That if I'm going to teach others individually through dialogue or through my artwork, then that's what's left behind. Okay, and if you're truthful in your artwork and in your approach, that lessens the ability for others to misinterpret your artwork which then lessens the ability for your artwork to maintain its place in history. And we all have, you know, we're all here, we have this creative gene that's in us. You know, it's really unusual to be an artist. That's strange. You know you've experienced it in your, some of you've experienced this in, this in your life. Family members, friends, you're an artist. Oh, will you draw a picture for me? You know, like that, you know what I mean? Like that kind of thing, and you're like, I don't draw pictures. <laughs> I take a brick and a stick of gum and make something interesting from that, you know? And, and, so, and so from that, you know, like that, but that's important. Right. And that's important to you. So now do you, how do you make sense of that in a way that's truthful? Yeah. I mean, I ran. I get, I get hyped up. I'm Next. sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through the artwork. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Says Chris, Christopher, see, we're smoke schooling right now with no cigars <laughs> being lit. All right. Um, <laughs> that's my statement right there. I basically fold paper airplanes, black paper airplanes, and um, these designs, right? These designs are the design that I flew 
when I was in Jamaica. Okay? And at the time, that was the most fun that I had, it was to fold these planes, get on the highest building, and throw them. Right? Um, my work is really about looking for pure formal blackness where blackness, the definition of blackness, is, has a light quality to it, has a childlike, ephemeral quality to it. Usually when you, or especially here, the definition of black here in America is definitely um, weighted. <laughs> it's very hard to deal with black and it be um, anything other than negative yeah right so my work really is trying to figure out how can you have a large amount of visual blackness visual weight without it feeling negative literally that's that's what it's about right and um, yeah yeah it's about but not just, not just for a, but for black people, for, for black Americans to recognize blackness, pure blackness, a lot of it, and also not be affected by that, right? So, you know, when you have like a, um, a puffy who has a party every year, the white party, right? Where it's mandatory that you want, you dress in white, right? That's significant. It, it may not be, it may not, it may not seem like it, but that's significant. The white tea to be pure. I'm, I'm gonna rock my white tea to be the purest gangster possible. That's significant, right? So my work is about trying to achieve a large amount of blackness and that response of purity, that, that, that response of um, I want to be there. Right, so the planes being together is being in close proximity without having tension. That's that's what my work is about. Do you, do you ever face like um, an anti, like someone says, "Oh, you're being anti, anti-white." Yes. As opposed to being, <laughs> being pro or. Yes. 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 I mean, a lot of the critique. Well, that's the thing. The thing is, okay, you make a. You make a white paper airplane, that's what it's supposed to be. You make a black paper airplane, all of a sudden it's, um, it's a stealth bomber. <laughs> right? I, I've, I've had classmates come up to me, hey, you know, I just, I just wanted to talk to you because <laughs> I thought you were trying to bomb the world. <laughs> no. No. And that's, and that's the issue. The issue is, yeah, no, I'm not talking about that. Really, I... I, I you know, I'm an art, art historian as well. I understand the Western Canada, I understand the, the rules of, of why something is beautiful, right? The, um, <laughs> the, issue, <laughs> the issue here is, yeah, in Jamaica especially, I would say Jamaica, I was born in 1978, okay? And I would say at that time, Jamaica was a straight up post-colonial society, right? Before I even knew what post-colonialism meant. Right, but in Jamaica, we have a saying all the time when you play checkers, nobody wants to play with the red checkers. You say black is beautiful, red is corruption. <laughs> right, so in Jamaica, there is this um, yeah, you want to be as dark skinned as possible in Jamaica. I'm not sure that's what it is now, but I'm just saying, you know, when that's the way I grew up, right? So, understand, I understand that this, this aesthetic or this, this relationship with blackness is a trained construct. And my work is trying to uh, correct that. Eric Mason. I'm Eric Mason. Uh, well, I gotta get the mic. You gotta get the mic, though. You got the mic. <laughs> All right, so go, go to the image. Okay. So this work, is a celebration of an object that I grew up with that was very important to me as a, as a younger man. 
uh, the pay telephone and, and its extinction. It's not so much extinct here in New York. It's still somewhat relevant because I still see them. They're a bit nasty, but I still see them. <laughs> but in Atlanta, they're gone. They're, they're, they're gone. Most of the ones, these images I made are all gone. So, so that work was, uh, yeah, was a, was a, was a nostalgic for me. It was a celebration for me. Uh, a lot of the time I spent as a child, we hung out at the phones for whatever reason. Uh, it, it, I shot it in film, so I'm, I'm a purist photographer. I like to shoot film. I like to shoot black and white. I hand printed these, but th those are actually inkjet, but I did hand print those. I developed the film myself. So that, that work primarily is about, is about me in terms of what I did as, as a younger child. And, and those pay phones, I remember when they were a dime make a call for a dime. Now everybody's addicted to cell phones. So that made that work relevant. We can go to the next image now. And this work here is, uh, I like to shoot things in the street that people don't necessarily pay attention to uh, and, and put them on the wall and, and make the viewer admire them. So for, for this work, it, uh, it has a lot to say in terms of semiotics. It has a lot to say in, in terms of uh, composition it was also an experimental digital process I was doing, which now is pretty recognized called HDR. But I was shooting this with a medium format digital camera. So I combined seven, uh, and I'm talking about process, not so much theory right now, but I combined seven, seven different exposures to get this pretty blue that you see. So uh, this was about how graffiti occupies the space. So landscapes with graffiti in the space. Could you go into semiotics? Yeah. Semiotics, so sign, signifier, signify. Uh, when we see something, what you say, iconography? Yeah. So when you see something, the mind, usually due to advertisement or just sometimes due to our own exposure, the mind automatically links it with something else. So uh, semiotics, also in artwork, it has to do with, with usually some, some type of text because the mind automatically recognizes text. So we try to. We try to make text familiar. For example, there's uh, a tag up there called NOLA. So automatically that means New Orleans because of semiotics, but that's something different for someone else. So that, that's what this work is about. I was, well, I think we can all stand in for Meech on this. Yeah. All right, um, Meech would say, stop all that reading and make the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> make the work. Make the work. Right, which you know, we, we often go back and forth in terms of philosophy and all that, but we're we not that different. And he wrote a lot, by the way. He wrote a lot. Let's read what he, well, <laughs> he wrote a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, um, I would say this while you're reading. Um, Meech is probably the most authentic <coughs> artist that I've known. Bless you. Most authentic artist I know. Um, born in Forest, Florence, Alabama family, heavy, heavy southern roots, and his work isn't a, um, his work isn't contrived. His, he, he had an awesome exhibition last year at um, an Atlanta gallery, <laughs> right? But um, Meech, uh, yes, Meech, fisherman, outdoorsman, um, he's just a great guy to meet, period. But southern roots. Southern right, roots. Right. Contemporary graffiti, like you know, he, he it becomes a mashup of all these interests within within an individual work. And, and yeah, I was I would say this, like when you when you meet the what we know as the founders of Smoke School of Art, um, each one of them carry a, a, a different perspective. You know, like when you talk to Chris, you're gonna talk to a historian, a critic, you're gonna talk to someone that's probably gonna be doing your first critique of your work. You know, then you'll talk to Eric, and Erica, you know, sit back in the cut, you know, he'll, you know, chop it up with you and basically break down the way that you're thinking about the work. Meech is going to be the one that's going to tell you to go do the work. But what Michi also brings is this force for you to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And not only by words, but by you watching him be authentic. He, you don't see him do anything that he doesn't believe in. If he says it, it is. There's no questions. Yeah. 
and you and you see it in every line of his work. You see it in. I, I will say that in the time that I've been in smoke school, whenever I look at my work and I have to question myself, is this authentic? I always think back to Meech, and I go, okay, well, am I being who I truly am as an artist? And if I feel like I'm skipping steps, which is a, another small school phrase, yeah. if I feel like I'm skipping steps, which basically means that I'm not going through the whole process, I'm jumping from one place to another, or I'm using cliches or rhyming words to get my point across. Yeah, no rhyming. No rhyming. No rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm doing that to get my point across or if I'm doing that in the work then I need to start over yeah well part of well said part part of uh, Meech's work is uh, navigation so he gets a lot of his found objects from where he's been how he um, from fishing from gardening. gardening I mean he's probably Cotton. Cotton. I mean, but it's put together in a way that's, it's not kitsch. No. It's not kitsch. It's the, because, and the reason it's not kitsch is because he has an honest relationship with those objects. It's not decoration. Um, yeah, it's not. It's and he's able to do something really beautiful, and that is, oftentimes when we use materials or we use objects, they, they can often look placed or contrived. Well, Boom. You know, Boom. so, and that's very hard to do because I use objects. So it's very hard to put an object on an image and for it not to look placed. So he's able to put that, that object on the image and it looks like it's part of the image. And that's, that's what makes his work really, really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, for example, I mean, this was just happened to be a moment <coughs> We were having an exhibition, a pop-up exhibition, and he had these um, uh, We've Been Gold. He's been working on this. He's, got a, he's probably got about six series of uh, work of art that he's dealing with. And uh, one of his series is We've Been Gold. And he would mention, you know, you can look at video work and you know, when he's talking about this, but um, in a lot of the neighborhoods, where he may have lived and whatnot, you would say, you know, we buy gold. So instead of we buy gold, we've been gold. And really talking, addressing some of the cultural, social aspects that, that are connected to uh, African uh, diaspora cultures that, you know, we, we come from a place of, of enrichment and we were creatives and things like that. And so, just being here at this moment, a veteran, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, a veteran at it, of it, you know, it's just like the perfect moment, his eye to be able to be, to conceive that, of course, we all smoke cigars, yeah. except for Karina. Right. So, uh, <laughs> and we waiting on Karina. Karina's gonna start smoking soon. <laughs> I offer her one every time we get together, she's turned me down, so I, now I get her gum cigars to satisfy <laughs> until she's ready to, graduate to a real cigar. So this, this again is uh, another example of Michi's work where I, I mean everything that, uh, I don't mean embellish in, in a negative way, but his whole life, he's 24 seven thinking about art. Nonstop. Nonstop. I mean, in, Nonstop. Ter in terms of theory and homework, he will send me stuff that I've never heard of. And, and I'm like, what? And he's, he's not, this is the thing about Meech. When you see Meech, you'll be thrown off because you think that, you know, oh, he's just a cool artist. Nonstop. <laughs> Nonstop, he's researching. Nonstop, he's, and, and, and we get into it. <laughs> we get into it and proving our point. I would say this about Meech in terms of this piece. We've been gold. We've been gold is probably a part of, uh, I, I would claim it. I would claim it as a smoke school thing, right? Where we're not victims. We don't believe in artwork that places blackness as victimhood or sympathy. We don't sell sympathy for black culture. Anybody else want to meet you? Boom, Karina. Boom, Karina May. Get on it, Karina. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I approached this um, series, the Trouble Seat series. I'm reading um, Carnegie Wilson and his approach to thinking about and uh, educational systems for African Americans. Um, talking to my sisters at that time, they were still uh, one of them was finishing up high school, and she's talking about how a school in the system is passing down books to the high school that I attended also. And it put me in a bad place, you know, I felt bad. How can a school within the same school system give me hand-me-downs, give my sister hand-me-downs? How is this school system approaching education for, um, for its people, for the people in the community, okay? So I started, my focus on education. I'm coming from a family full of teachers. I'm, um, grandparents, both sides of my family are educators. Um, my great-grandmother being an educator, being a fourth generation um, graduate of a HBCU, education is important to my family, okay? I began to push the work. This is one of the first pieces out of the series. Um, I'm looking at how a student is reduced um, to being this utilitarian object. How they're not focused, they're looked at as money, they're cycled through the system, how much money can they get in, how much money is um, going out, etc. I'm looking at, so I I look at these, these students as these utilitarian objects, these desks. Instead of using them, using the figure, I'm looking at their symbolism associated with them. Um, I'm looking at scale. My scale is uh, miniature size. Um, talking about like a seven inch piece, three inches wide. Um, I'm looking at, with this piece, how the student has gone through the system. Instead of progressing, they're they're, they're regressing in a sense. All right, they start off as a whole person. You would expect them to grow and, and develop, however, um, they're being destroyed in some way, shape, or form. Um, the stair step is not um, pointing in a positive direction, an upward direction, it's kind of linear. So I'm looking at that work. Um, then I'm also looking at the, the teacher and how their approach to education is just as stressful, right? They're just, they're reduced to being a number, being uh, in the classroom to try to cycle these students through in some cases, not all. Um, so I have these two perspectives. I have this teacher who is, um, loves her job or his job or their job they are praised for their job. They're given this abundance of, of, um, of apples right? um, for symbolism. But versus this, this teacher who has a different perspective on their job. Right? They're, they're faced with the administrative, the paperwork, the, the stress of it all. So in this series, I'm taking a couple of people in their approach to education, the student, the teacher, administration, and looking at how the educational system has uh, affected um, our students, basically. Julio. All right. <laughs> what, one thing, I don't think I need that. I'm cool. I like this one. I like this one. One thing I like, uh, I like about being a collective is you know, I spent 20 years kind of on top of a mountain in North Georgia. And before then, I worked a decade for the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru, when uh, we were going through hard times. And those 20 years, at, you know, pretty much at that time, 70,000 Peruvians were killed by terrorism. And, uh, you know, I was a part of that. I worked for a department that was... Um, you know, counterterrorism and everything I heard through the radios, through the TVs, what I physically saw, uh, friends of mine that were uh, blown up, uh, it, it changed a lot of how I saw the world. 
And uh, before then, you know, I'm blessed. I come from a lineage of artists. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was a French Impressionist. My uh, grandfather that just passed away, he died a national treasure. Uh, his name was Gabriel Chula Clausi. He was a, uh, a director, a bandonista, composer of tangos. Does anybody here know what tango is? Yeah. All right, I, I promise you, you heard one of his tangos. And my great uncle, he wrote in the late 1800 tangos, also almost like 800 tangos. So uh, one of the last things my grandpa, now you take a moment, man. <laughs> I was in Sao Paulo, and my grandpa passed away at 98. He was 96 at the time. And it was uh, Gustavo Santolaya, a wonderful fellow who wrote the music for North Country, Broke Rag Mouth, and things like that. He did a, he did a thing of called Café de los Maestros. So of course, all the great uh, maestros de tango were there, and this was in Sao Paulo. And it was six, seven o'clock in the morning, and I see my grandfather playing his bandoneon. And uh, it was uh, doble A, which is the Stradivarius of bandoneons. And I asked him, I said, why does the orchestras never play when you play? And they have these beautiful orchestras, these wonderful dancers, and any maestro that sings or plays, there's always accompaniment. And he goes, well, I, I think he said like 70 years before, he broke down the chambers of the bandoneon because it did not have the sonority that he felt. You know, the soul, uh, the bandoneon, uh, air going through the bandoneon is like your soul. It's the closest thing. And, and that's when my paintings changed because I was, I, I don't think I was being true to myself. I was using paint, like what paint's supposed to be used for. Uh, I was uh, painting images, you know, like if I saw a pretty girl, I'd paint the pretty girl. If I saw a cool looking house or whatever, somebody, and I threw all that crap away. And I started looking at my mediums totally different. I started pushing every medium. I started finding out where it came from, who manufactured it. If it's a 500 tube of oil, uh, what part of France was it made of? What kind of pigment? What kind of oils did they use? Who did it? Was it made by hand? And I would push it forward. I would push it even further to create colors that actually meant something to me. If I drank a Merlot with my grandfather, you know, when I was four, because I was told that he would pour a little bit of wine in my water, I wanted to create, mm -hmm. create that color, create that moment, that essence. And I started to do that. And I spent uh, 20 years in the mountain, uh, pretty much by myself, painting, and collectors would go to my home. And if it wasn't for a collective like this, and when, you know, me personally, when I met you guys earlier, uh, you were wonderful, beautiful, you know, very open to talk to. And if you can keep that relationship within yourselves to, uh, to grow your whole life, and, and I'm sorry, I might have sidetracked, but when I met this collective, all I was doing, I was hanging out with an artist. And uh, I'm not going to say I'm a aficionado of cigars, but in Peru, they're cheaper than cigarettes. So that's <laughs> these guys, I smell all these cigars, and nobody smokes cigars. So, and they pulled me out of this. And I wouldn't have met Frances C. Tart here. And uh, how you doing? I wouldn't have met these wonderful feminists and, you know, Ray over there, this Ray. Ray. badass Ray. photographer in New York. And... Uh, and I wouldn't met you guys because I was so focused on myself, my art, my process, deep in the mountains. And now I've gone, you know, I've had paintings that just sold right across this tunnel. I don't even know what it's called, Holland Tunnel or something. Yeah. And it helped scholarships, you know, everywhere. And I, and I love being a philanthropist. I love yeah, taking, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, to see the kids and what you can do with the paintings and the money that comes with the paintings. And to see you guys grow, I wish, I wish I would have met them earlier. You know, it's been four or five years now, and I don't know how many thousands of people I met because of them. You know, I was happy where I was at. You know, in my studio making work every day. I didn't have to talk to nobody. I didn't have to see nobody. And, uh, you know, and one thing I found, like I was talking about my grandpa, once I found my truth, Everything's so successful. I mean, you can't go wrong. And your collectors, the galleries, museums, uh, you know, everything I do is about lineage. 
So everything has a story. And when I say story, I don't mean narrative, but every visceral gesture, every color is something about my life. And when somebody puts it in collection, like uh, I think uh, the Cultural Patrimony of Peru, there, that name of the painting, I think, is Ketchikup. And my grandpa and my family lost everything through, through dictators. So I'll put a town that maybe got destroyed or maybe they took from my family. So when somebody researches this, they go, oh, shit. You know, this is a part of history we need to know about. And some people don't know a lot about the, our history or South American history. That's basically it. I hope I didn't talk too much. Well, actually what it is is we stole Julio. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Julio used to be part of another art collective. And I'm not going to mention them. Not worth mentioning. He was part of another art collective, and they came to Smoke School to hang out with us. Well, when it got cold, they decided to leave. Julio went to his car, got his chair, came back, and started sitting with us. And he became Smoke School on that day. So, you know, just be careful because we'll steal your members too. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Did, did I have an image up there? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah, you did. Can I, can I the see? Whole time. They don't tell me anything, by the way. <laughs> Everything is like, I had to take my dog to the spa on a Sunday. Can I see what image you showed? It might be ugly. I don't even know. Why don't you tear it up in front of everybody? I had to leave my dog. And then the, these are huge, by the way. Eight foot, nine foot, ten foot. And um, can you see a little bit of the explosive nature of this one? Okay. <laughs> it really doesn't do the just a, a colorful and atmospheric. Transparent, atmospheric, and opaque. Just, it's incredible. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and yeah, it goes beyond, his work goes beyond, and I'm not trying to speak for you, Julio, but it does go beyond the Jackson Pollock, I'm going to drip some paint. Right? There, there's the essence of Tango, the essence of his exper uh, Julio's experience of counterterrorism, <laughs> family, like it's there, you feel it. And you know, I, I, can't, I can't make you see it, the work speaks for itself. When you do the investigation, it's there. So, um, now, <laughs> I'm kind of all over the place uh, as, as an artist, meaning in terms of my mediums, from painting, drawing, sculpture, performance art, uh, you know, public art, selling artwork, but at the end of the day, I find kind of truth in each one of those areas, but I've decided to kind of focus on in terms of uh, uh, the work that I want to show you is, is uh, one area that I'm, one body of work that I'm kind of interested in right now is going back, uh, I want to say, I want to say the effects well, yeah, the effects of, say, um, other uh, groups of people affecting other groups of people. And, and so through this case, there was, uh, with this particular individual work, uh, there's abolitionist. Uh, his name is John Woolman. Yeah, if I say abolitionist, do you, i got to ask this because not everybody knows what, what an abolitionist is. Do you know what an abolitionist is? All right, okay. So. What is it? <laughs> Well, so if you go back to uh, 1700s, even mid-1700s, um, the kind of the dawn of the abolitionists, which really was kind of connected to Christianity, uh, even though my work doesn't Quakers. really approach uh, religion, Quakers. but the Quakers and their involvement in, in trying to be a true Christian. So it's not necessarily that they, that early abolitionists were sympathetic to uh, individuals who may have been, who were black, they were just more interested in being a pure Christian. So here is a person that's enslaved, and how do I then rectify myself with God, in terms, terms, in terms of them having their conversation with themselves, how do I rectify myself in terms of relationship with God if I'm going to be a Christian, and here's this other person that's now, you know, we know about slavery, all right? So, John Woolman was a particular individual from the North who, went, who traveled to the South and, and uh, a charismatic individual and tried to convert a number of uh, slave uh, owners to, if they were Christian and claiming Christian, to convert them into 
considering letting their slaves free. And for those who may not have let their slaves free, he would have um, paid them, give like, like slip slaves uh, money on the side and things like that. And so just a, a, just a very interesting uh, individual. And he's got a number of writings you can go back and read and research. And in my mind, I begin to think about the weight of that individual, a, a, a small percentage of, of, of people at that time, who's especially traveling to the South and trying to convert people. And so I'm a sailor. I, I like to sail. Um, and so I began to kind of think about that slave trade and sailing and John Woolman kind of tacking against the system of of, of culture at that time and the weight of that. And so this is kind of, I won't say dedicated to, but inspired by uh, John Woolman. Right? So uh, this is, again, this body of work of, of dealing with uh, groups of people affecting other groups of people. And so this other um, more recent time uh, dealing with gentrification, I know you all know what's going on in Brooklyn and stuff like that. So, uh, but this is in Atlanta, it's going all over. So. Uh, in Atlanta, though, you do have uh, a number of neighborhoods uh, being gentrified. So families, let me just say this too, by the way. Before I moved down south, because I'm from the Midwest, Iowa, Illinois, I was taught that the south existed a certain way. And when I moved there, I discovered that everything that had been taught about the south was a lie. A pure lie. That, that, that... I actually had more personal confrontations dealing with racial issues up north than I did in the south. And I, I my, me personally, respect the south in that it, it's, there's no gray area. No. <laughs> there's no gray area. You know who hates you in the south. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so it's like, and, and actually, it's not as broad as it's, as it's, made, as it's no. made out to be. No. And so there's landowners. I began to have a new reflection on what the civil rights movement was about in terms of these were business owners, these were lawyers, they, these were engineers who had, had, who had money and they wanted to live where they wanted to live. So with that being said, there's a number of neighborhoods that, that, that go back you know, 40, 50 years ago that are now being gentrified based on this, these groups of uh, African Americans who laid the foundation and now they've died. Right? So, those houses and neighborhoods that they lived in have now been taken over, okay? And, and the people who don't have a bite, who really have the least voice are children. So and I'm not trying to play off with sympathy, but that's just a fact. So this particular uh, piece dealing with the weight of, of um, structural, uh, you know, dilapidated buildings on children, and you go through these neighborhoods and, and they aren't, you know, the trash not, might not be taken. When, uh, when trash should be taken. And so here, of course, lowers the value of the, of the neighborhood or contractors paying uh, homeless individuals to burn buildings to, make the, the, to lower, again, the value of, of, of buildings. Of course, that works into areas that uh, Karina was talking about of education and things like that. And so you know, this particular piece is dealing with that. Again, I have a, a variety of um, bodies of work that I'm working on. And, these two particular pieces are examples of that. And just like Julio's uh, work, these two pieces that he's shown, when you see them here, they have no justice. It's a real sailboat inside of a building that's huge. And when you see it, it, it completely, I mean, we, we were in this one space and it took up most of the space. It's, it's awe-inspiring. And this piece right here, what you're not able to see here is the fact that the carpet is ingrained in the concrete. And I kept asking him, like, how did you get the carpet in the concrete? And he still hasn't told me. So, but I mean, you have two pieces of concrete here, and they're connected by the carpet. And I mean, the work is fantastic. You always say dope. I generally say dope, but I, I was really blown away by the 10 toes down. I, I know we're spending quite a bit of time on, in, on our individual work, but this is also important for us to kind of get into the collective and see the truthfulness. Do, do you mind, uh, Chris, talking about Carlos? Carlos? Um, Real quick. Absolutely. I'm Carlo, MFA photographer, MA uh, printmaker. 
100% dirty south, North Carolina, Venice Beach. Hmm. Gangster. Gangster. You know who, who Easy is? In Puerto Rico. She's a female Easy. Puerto Rico. Oh, right. man, she's gangster. Right. She's gangster. So, um, Carla, definitely unapologetic. Definitely um, also very um, in interested in uh, gender, yeah. masculinity, right? Um, about roles, sexuality, right? So these now are her evolution. These aren't just straight photographs. These are now collages that are then printed through. Um, the printing process, right? She does inkjet printing, yeah. and yeah, mostly just inkjet now. Oh. I think she did some silkscreen as well. So this is right, but um, often it's about being proud of the underground Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. As well as being as well as elevating womanhood to being more powerful than manhood, if you will. She yeah. calls herself King Carla. I am King Carla. <laughs> she, she's That's in her. the fifth phase of uh, feminism. Right. <laughs> <Even though it's laughs> I mean, yes. But also, you know, she retains... She's a lady. She's a lady. She's a lady, but uh, <laughs> don't mess with her. <laughs> Don't mess with her, dog. Um, she will cut you. <laughs> she will cut you. <laughs> right? So, um, super authentic, super... Uh, Nurturing and authentic. And right, right now, she's, she teaches uh, a group of middle school students. So, it's like this, this notion of, of, at one moment, her work will re read... Uh, Almost pornographic. Pornographic, yes. And, but yet at the same time, there's this intrigue that one can feel towards her work. You know, even though they're collages, which the collage itself becomes a makeup of the body, but then it's a photo, it's makeup on top of makeup. So she takes a photograph of the makeup. But <laughs> so, well, what's interesting is because Atlanta is this city where there's always a party, there's always an art party, there's always something going on. There's this, there's this time where there was flyers everywhere. And in order for you to get someone to go to your party, your flyer had to be better than the next person's flyer. So I, I think we like help Miami's flyer company like go off the I mean off the chain because everybody had these glossy, shimmery flyers and everyone's had to be different. Then they start doing different shapes. And her work, when you see it, kind of resembles these flyers to some degree because they have that kind of uh, quality where even though it's collage is so beautifully done that it doesn't look just like a collage. It looks like they look like huge flyers, but they're telling you something. As you know, collage is not easy to do at all. Not, not with it looking good. No. Boom. Boom. That's me. <laughs> um, so my work is about, uh, we have a, one of the first parts of Smoke School was um, critique when you, before you get before you allow to call yourself a smoke school member and you have to do your homework you have to do your artist statement but you do your artist statement after you have a formal critique from the founders so all of them evaluate your work and um, I call it hazing <laughs> um, because and, uh, and you, um, Marvin will tell you, because Marvin came down for Christmas and we hazed him. So <laughs> he's, he's, he's participated in some hazing as well. <laughs> yes, he has. But the thing is, is like, so it's a it's a, a type of I call it hazing out of a joke, but it's really what it is is when I originally started um, Smoke School, I was doing these watercolor abstracts, and um, Chris came to the house and says, "You're not interested in this." And I'm like, dude, I just did 20 of them. He said, no, nah, you ain't interested in this. I have a solo show coming up in a couple of weeks. Nah, this ain't what you're interested in, dog. This is, nah, you interested in sculpture. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested in that. So about two weeks later, I started doing sculpture. <laughs> because what, it, what they were able to do through the homework and through the critique was show what elements I was using that showed that I was doing sculpture. They also forced me, because of the homework, 
and forced me to study what it is I wanted to discuss. And I say all that to say how I got to the post-colonial theory. So I come to post-colonial theory through the idea of if I was an African that was kidnapped and brought to America immediately, what would I be, what would I have been in Africa? And I believe that I would have been a mystic. And that's because of being an artist and some of my spiritual beliefs. So then I, me being a mystic, what would I then create here as a mystic? So I would create these items of power, these items that would turn power back to the people that are here, but also have a connection back to Africa. So I would then use American items, found objects, to replicate the things that I created when I was in Africa. I just came here with nothing. So I began creating these items. Um, and one of the first ones I created, I think is actually the other image. Okay, okay, so there's just this one. So I started using these, um, I found through art history, I found a piece from the Congo with uh, nails, um, where the nails are, uh, from the Nikosi people of the Congo. And those nails, when they're put into the piece, they uh, shoot out this power back into the community. And when they shoot out this power back into the community, it's also like creating a, um, a bond or a, a legal agreement. So if me and Julio created an agreement, then I take a nail, I put it into the piece, and it causes that power to come back between us. And I'm obligated, both of us are obligated, to follow through with that contract. So that's how they started. So I did a series of 15 of those. Um, also, when you're part of small school, one of your first series that you do, you have to do a series of 10. And the reason why you do that series of 10 is so that you work through the whole process of creating a body of work. So your first three or four are the nice, pretty ones, and then you get to six or seven, and you run completely out of all ideas and you can't figure out why you started this in the first place. And then you come back around, around eight, and you start going, okay, so I've done all this stuff before, so now I need to complete it, and how do I complete it? And then you, you do those last two pieces, which then will encourage you to do a couple more because you, you re-energize. So after doing those 10 pieces, I then did five more pieces, um, and, I, and that series is called Kukabuku Kifu, which is meant to remember the dead, um, and it was based off of the Middle Passage and how um, I imagined myself as someone that was part of the Middle Passage during slavery and what they would be thinking about along that passage. So are they thinking about time? Like they can't tell the time. They're thinking about that they can't you know, they can't smell the flowers. I didn't get to say bye to my mother. Uh, where are my children? Um, you know, I remember, I remember the smell of the grass. I remember, you know, just trying to stay positive, trying to stay within their mind. Um, so they're going through all these different things. Um, and I created those pieces based on that. Um, the next series I did, I, I named all my pieces. So this is kind of funny. So I named all my pieces. And then Chris comes to me and says, so what's the name of that piece there? I said, man, I don't know. I got it written down somewhere. He goes, you don't remember the name of your pieces? I remember all the names of my pieces. I said, fine. So the next series I did, I stopped naming my pieces. I'm too old. I named them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I titled, I titled the work, and then I just go one, two, three after that. So this is... Um, part of a series called Writing Letters Home. So this series is part of, um, of me, me putting together um, graffiti and uli, which is a style of writing out of um, Nigeria from the Igbo people. And it was a, uh, it, it kind of reminded me of graffiti because of, with the Igbo, when they would do the uli, when they create the uli, they would, um, it could be destroyed either by water, because they would do it on houses, and because it was done with this, uh, 
is ephemeral quality. So they would create this um, ink out of uh, berries and grind it up with water, and then they would write on the skin. They put it on the skin and it would disappear, and they would put it on on the walls, and then it would the rain season would go and then it would disappear. So it kind of reminded me of graffiti because you know I mean we live in New York, so well y'all live in New York. Maybe I'm speaking uh, to the future. Um, <laughs> But so in New York, you know how graffiti goes. So they put up graffiti and then it gets washed away and then someone else puts up more graffiti. And, um, and I thought about, okay, so that has a connection with Uli. And I said, well, if I was to write a letter back to Africa, what would I say? You know, as a mystic, I would want them to know that I'm here. They may not know that I'm here. You know, so let me tell them that I'm here and that I still love them and I'm waiting on them to come get me. You know, or I'm waiting on them to recognize me as still being here, that I'm still alive, don't forget me. So I, with, um, with also using American things such as uh, the quilting process, I'm integrating into the pattern that are African, that are done in a, a graffiti type way, I, creating glyphs, I'm also intersecting fabric, which some of it is African and some of it is American, to build that quilting quality so that they recognize me when they receive this letter. So, um, so that's what that is. So, so here, what's interesting about this is the fabric, um, I wanted to do with the fabric, I wanted to um, sculpt it. So that it wasn't just a canvas laying on the wall. I wanted to actually create a shape into it that, um, that was purposeful, um, that had intent. Because oftentimes, sometimes uh, when people are looking at your work and they can create it any kind of way, then they take part in it in a way that they begin owning it. I wanted them to know that it was my letter that I wrote to a certain group of people and that no one else had a choice over any of those lines or markings. So when you see this from different ways, you see the, um, like when you see these glyphs here and those glyphs up there, if you look at it from this way, you see them one way, and from the other way, you see them another way. This is nine feet by six feet. So the, again, the, the difficulty, part of the difficulty is, one reason why you're hearing the extent of what we talk about is because the, the effect of the homework. So, which is very true, <laughs> truthful. So I, I, I go back to a question that was asked earlier, uh, like what are the things that we do? And we mentioned homework. Um, that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg of it. But one example of homework we might have covered, I'm sorry, one example of homework that we might have covered, we did a, um, like this month we're doing a series on, on women's issues. I mean, it's March. So uh, we're, we're Again, this is on it's posted on Facebook. It's open to everyone to dialogue in and give feedback on. And so each month we're posting uh, either artist, a poet, architect, <laughs> uh, female, um, gender related, multi gender related. We, us, we yeah, cover we cover everything. Yeah, we cover everything. There is nothing that is left undiscussed. Even if we don't like it, yeah. even if none of us like it. We'll still talk about the fact either we liked it, we'll find something out of it, because there's generally going to be one of us that's going to say, well, I, I kind of like that piece. I mean, I don't know what you was thinking about it. I like yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. We had an interesting talk uh, last year between um, uh, Brutalism Architecture and uh, Jacoby Satterwhite. Yeah. You know, and like, yeah, and what kind of relationship between architecture and Satterwhite is there? With that, with that aesthetic, yes. Yeah. Right now, you're talking. What do you want to do for homework? What do you want to do for homework next week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can email us and say, "Hey, this is what I, this is something I'm thinking about," and it becomes a topic. Do you want to do it next week? <laughs> I'll think about it. Yeah. 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 Sure. Cool. <laughs> All right, that's what's up. Send it to us. Hey, as long as it isn't about Smoke School of Art, then hey. <laughs> <laughs>
No, but that, that's that's how it evolves, and and like we're, we've um, we've built a relationship with Tart Collective. Y'all familiar with Tart Collective here in New York? Yeah. Who said yes? <laughs> can, you can you tell us about something about Tart Collective? I know Katarina, who has been a part of it for a long time. Feminist Tart Collective. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the longest running feminist art collective in the world, actually. Wait, wait, wait your hand, Susan. Suzanne, right there. <laughs> and our collective member right there in the building. So we're, we're bringing them, we're, uh, we, I won't say bringing them, I'm sorry about that offended, but we, we've linked up and we're gonna have in Atlanta, Fender Symposium. Symposium exhibition. Here's, here's another part of the collective. Part in the house? <laughs> So like those kind of relationships, it's really about building relationships. So you know, you may have heard, uh, you know, you've, you've read the mission statement, but at the end of the day, it's still, a, it's still about being truthful. It's about being truthful and building truthfulness. Build a community, yeah. mentorship, all that. So we'd like to open up a discussion. If you guys want to talk, ask questions. Absolutely. You guys talked about how you like to kind of, uh, you see yourselves as, you like to talk about yourselves as contemporaries or how you affect one another's work. And that, I, I kind of would want to hear more about that. Like how you guys, do you guys, in terms of, is it material or process or more like conceptual because you're working with these conceptual homeworks or like how do you guys see con yourselves connected in terms of, or is it just that root of your mission statement? Is that enough of a, did I make sense enough? Or? We, we, we challenge each other. So, for example, Openly. if one of us makes, makes a piece of work or makes a body of work, why are you doing that? What's it about? You know, give it, how does it relate to you? So I think those questions are important because if you work by yourself, who's going to do that? Maybe, maybe the curator of the gallery you're working for if you're working for a gallery, but that's just one person. So we have a group of people here to challenge each other's work. I guess, like, do you see your work as connect, like? As one? As not as iron? one, I guess, but as, like, kind of having a conversation or, a, uh, okay. I don't know. I got you, I got you. Yeah. I, I think I understand your question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I would, I would say this. Um, Michi considers himself a maker. I do not, <laughs> right? So his way of thinking about something is definitely different than the way that I think about something. Right? And I would say that there's makers in the group that probably would connect more with the way that meets, um, or that dialogue, if you will, right? And there's uh, more conceptual dialogue in the group where that fits in. But the real goal of the group is to give you the ammo, right? The ammo and the defense of your own work individually. So it's not about necessarily, like there's collaboration in the group. Like myself and Karina has a collaboration where we put our work together. But the ultimate goal is um, to give you the tools, right, so that you don't get up and be stuttering and not, and not feel comfortable discussing your work in any arena, right? So the reason why anyone can post the homework is like, hey, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this. Well, let's, let's hear this thought out in, in the open, honestly and then you can get some good feedback on that. So it's, it's not necessarily to create a hive mentality. It's really about sharpening the individual skills further. And as we show the group, the work usually has a good conversation. But as artists, we don't make work to have conversation with each other. So does that answer? Yeah. yeah. I took a piece to, um, we was all, uh, okay. We're also part of small school because Majority, like they said, we smoke sticks. Okay, so when Chris was living, when uh, Eric was living in Atlanta, he had this spot up on the roof. So I brought one of my pieces up there, and I was working on it while we were smoking. Both of them looked at it and said, "Why are you doing that, dog? That don't work." I said, "Because you know, I hooked all this stuff together, and I put this like this." And he's like, "No, nah, that's whack. You need to take some of those out." Right then. So 
it's an active critique. It's an active working where there is a collaboration even in each other's work to some degree. Well, I'll go to Chris's house and I'll see his work up and I'll be like, nah, man, you got too much brown right there, man. You need a mark or something. You got some pencil? Come on, man. You know? So, I mean, we're always, we're always thinking as a critique of each other because I personally feel that I don't want any member of small school to go out and allow you to critique it before I've critiqued it. You know, these are this is my family. You know, as uh, JP said, this is my logical family. So when they go out, I want them to be at their best, and they want me to be at they, at my best. So as you, your question was, you know, are are we together? Do we are, as one? Yes, smoke school is one. Definitely. But when I but if I was to show here individually, then I'm an individual. But I'm part of smoke school, and they will represent. And but 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 when there's a smoke school exhibition, you can tell it's a smoke school exhibition. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, still to further even your example, like every year, we go back to the basics. Yes. We're we're going back to re, to what can we learn more about the color red? Yeah. Straight up. Like just like seriously, like that, like that. What can we learn more about the color red? What about line? Yes. You know, so where does blue come from? And then build up again from there. So there's there's a starting point, and and we always keep resharpening our tools, and we've been doing it since 2009. What else? What other questions? Yes. Conversation. What did you learn about the color red? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you all were saying at the beginning that you you had your studio at, at this one place and you had to leave after a night of <laughs> disagreement, um, and that so I'm I'm just wondering, um, not just in that way in the in the conflict, but also like what has the response been from Atlanta and from like the our community or other communities there. I'm going to answer that. Yes. <laughs> yes, he's the best to answer. <laughs> we had a show with uh, <laughs> my friend Ray there. And, uh, for instance, that exhibition was, I don't know, two years ago when all those storms and ice and crap was going on here. They wore their boots and everything. Yes. And uh, the fellow that was the curator decided to cancel it. Yeah. Now, he's from an important family in Atlanta. <laughs> No, and nobody say no names, thank wow. you. Bring that story up there? Yeah, I'm gonna bring that story up. <laughs> it has to do with New York. That's true. Beautiful it does. people. And That's uh where we met Ray. <laughs> how we met Ray. And this individual canceled, I think it was like sixteen of us, sixteen artists. Right. And it was important. So, you know, universities is important. You have to do you have you must do social and you know, this is important for everybody. It's important. And he canceled it like two days earlier. Oh, that dude. Yeah, that guy. Please, uh -huh. don't say that. So, <laughs> like I said, important family, donates many things to the museums, right. etc. cetera. But I don't really give a shit, <laughs> okay? My work has to be strong enough to where I can, you know, if I'm gonna sell, I can sell anywhere, if it's gonna be collections, and not worry about these, these individuals. So I told him he's canceled. And I wouldn't have any association with somebody of that character. And we had one of the best exhibits. Yes. And back to back, then we, uh, I think it was the New York City College. City, City University of New York. City you College know, I have uh, one of my works in their right, collections, right. wonderful. And it would have never happened if you allow certain individuals that are in this world, in this art network, to, uh, to make those choices. Oh. Right after that, what they considered uh, the most powerful individual, one of the most powerful individuals in the South, decided he would talk, take upon himself to call out a few artists. Now, keep in mind, these individuals have large networks in their social media. Do we all agree? You wouldn't mess with any, uh, some serious yeah. people? <clears throat> well, this, this fellow, he, uh, he, he brought up some names because uh, it was, anybody know what the NBAF is? National Black Art Festival? Uh, and he said, uh, why are these people RSVPing, but I don't see the money? You know, basically you gotta put some money to go see certain artists. 
and he put my name, but he had never met me. He just saw a Spanish name, wasn't in his network, but he must have seen my name around. But I'm hidden in the mountains, so I don't do much social. I really don't care about cocktails. I have a wonderful array of scotches at my house, so I don't need any of them. An array. I'm a, I'm a self-made man. I don't need him or anybody else. So I called him out, and I said, you made a mistake. Uh, I am the featured artist for the NBAF, and you put my name on there. So immediately, of course, so I see that a lot. And I was lovely in my studio in my house for 20 years, and of course, <laughs> this collective, but I've seen things I can't believe. Like right now, we want to go to Chelsea, right? Yeah, 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 we're going to Chelsea. One guy said, what am I selling? Two right. years ago, three Assumption, years ago. a very rude guy. Often. I was just being polite, opening the door, because I'm a nice, big, polite guy. That's so true. I had to tear his program up in his gallery <laughs> but he doesn't realize now he's the director of my friend's gallery right down the road he got a, he got a problem. so you um, need to really be careful but don't be intimidated by individuals that want to control you and the art world just do strong work bone. have your own, truth, your own truth and don't worry about success bone. because it's going to come to you bone. there's nothing you have to do you don't have to create Whatever. I'm often sorry. I'm honest, not talk too often, much. often honesty is intimidating. Yes. Often honesty is intimidating. And and I'm sure by looking at our statements and hearing the things that we're saying, we we don't backpedal. We don't kowtow. We don't, nobody. we don't do any of that. So oftentimes where people would expect you because you're an artist and you need the money or or hey, won't you come be part of this show and you'll get some exposure. And you're like, dude, but Exposure ain't paying nobody's bills, man. Bank of America don't take exposure. Bank of America takes cash. So. I mean, but even then. But even what, then, if we don't agree, nah. So the thing is, is because of that, you often have. There's been times where we've had conflicts, and there's been times where. Time up, time up, time up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The only conflict is if you're not being honest. That's really the only conflict, Jim. I mean. Other than that, in terms of um, support from Atlanta, we're here. Yeah. We appreciate your support, right? In terms of um, do we thrive on support from others? No. And, and we're, we are not going to change one word, one iota. We're not going to try and. We've been asked to. And we've been asked to by older, like powerful African Americans. We're not doing that. Let the work speak for itself, and you'll then you get to SBA. And and, right? and the flip side of that and the flip side of that is, we we do get a lot of support from Atlanta. There, we do. We we're in Burnaway. We are in colleges. We, do. we teach at different colleges. So certain people here. We, uh, we have lots of support in Atlanta. Absolutely. But the conflicts that you heard, of course, the negative always rises. Because those are emotional. But we've done tons of shows in Atlanta. We've right. been in museums in Mad Georgia. Love. Mad love. I mean, so we get a lot of love in Georgia. And once y'all meet us, as you know, we're completely lovable. Next question. <laughs> My man back there. We were waiting for you, man. <laughs> Spanish. Hello, hello, hello. Marvin, get on um, I wanted to ask you, you have a very strong. So I have to. Or yes. Ah, okay, great. Um, so you have a very strong mission statement. Yes. About which you, I, I, I would love to hear some more. Hey, okay. You also, mentioned, you also mentioned a very specific African uh, ritual yes. that. Uh, I have no idea what it is, honestly. No idea what talking about. I'm very out. curious. I'm very curious. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just bring it up. Uh, sure. So um, the, the artist statement itself came through a, uh, the mission. The mission statement came through one night. The collective got together and started, what do we really care about the most in understanding? Um, so each line was really contributed by another. All of us. All of us. There and agreed upon, if you will, right? So we assert that all modern art arrived, derives from Africa, 
That's your boy. Absolutely. Absolutely. In terms of breaking the human figure, right? Right? Y'all know, y'all know Vitruvian man, right? Everybody know Vitruvian and how perfect the body is to the Western canon of art, right? There's no way, there's no way that in that 300, 400 years of perfection of the human body that you would naturally break the body to get to cubism. But can I interject real quick? Please, please. Because you have other cultures already doing that way before that investigation right. from the Renaissance, from the rebirth. rebirth. Right. <laughs> right? So you, you have in India, the, the beautiful temples in there of, of investigating the figure and, and incorporating the figure into a number of the temples. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. The, to the absence of the body right. within, within a, a number of, of Middle Eastern cultures right. and, and architecture there. So, so you mentioned abstraction. You mentioned, you mentioned modernity. You mentioned uh, cutting away fluff and getting down to minimalism. You're talking about African thought. You're talking about African influence, right? The height of Western art, which myself and Sweet have theorized many times, <laughs> right? Ends at realism. After that, once you start breaking the form, once you start breaking the plane, once you start investigating that, you are investigating African process. Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah, and... Uh, yes, well, some more work. Yeah, just uh, I'm very the curious dogan. about that word, the dogon. Also, the maybe dogan, because I play yes. African music and I love to know what it is. The dogon. Well, Meech, Meech will be better at that. <laughs> no, the dogon. The dogon <laughs> is a, um, is a, a tribe in Africa that um, they do different ceremonies. They're known for a couple of different things. One thing that they're known for is their is their uh, ritual of the dead. Um, that's a ceremony that they do that they still now do in order to, um, from the pathway of someone passing on to life, from life to death, they do a ceremony of walking through the village and um, rather than um, mourning, they're celebrating his transition. Also what they were known for is being able to look into the stars, astrology, yes, with the naked eye. By being able to see stars far and away with their with the naked eye, mm -hmm. um, and that we come from, that we're of the we're, we're of, of the stars, stars. Right. we're of the stars, falling to the water and being born, yes, which is past the future, yeah, right. The noble savage, <laughs> yeah, the noble savage, um, also uh, in, in romanticism, right? Y'all know um, what's his name? It's a number of Rousseau, 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 yeah. Paul right, Rousseau. man is born um, good and don't doesn't have ill will, private property. So it's the, it's the basis of romanticism, right? And um, what that brings about is, um, or the adverse effects of the noble savage is, um, you know, the green mild. You have these magical Negroes that just exist in movies and in, exist in plot lines magically to help Western characters achieve something. So like um, Benjamin, the golf, the golf uh, uh, Bagger Vance. Bagger Vance. Right? Or, or, even, or even using real people that existed. Right, yeah. you know, right. So the, the, the butler. Avatar. Yeah. <laughs> right, so we're talking about, so the noble savages, it's, it's a pun and a reclaiming of that. Yes, we are, we are actually noble <laughs> in re response to that. But don't reside here. <laughs> right, we reside here. Um, rights of passage, they took me through the universe. My man Meech is missing. This is this is his whole thing right there, right? Um yeah, passage, my pigment. Oh, yeah, so pigment here and bone, that's Dubois. W E B Dubois, <laughs> right? Du Bois. <laughs> right? Um, often talked about the difference between <coughs> African Americans and Humanity, placing it simply in those three statements: pigment, hair, and bone. Right. So instead of looking at that pigment, hair, and bone as negative, right? We see it as positive. We see it, it as positive. positive and magical, even. <laughs> right. So um, 
So that's that's. So yes, we we accept that not as negative, right? We have been indoctrinated by Grammy hip hop. <laughs> you can't handle our extra muscle. Yes, there are, there are people that believe that black folks have extra muscles. <laughs> <laughs> but the extra muscle is really the mind. The mind, right? So <clears throat> the brain. It's it's a, it's an amalgamation of of yeah. We're, we're yeah. Yeah, and so. the grimy hip hop is based off of the South, you know, because a lot of and it's South. Well, I mean, like you talk about Jeezy, you talk about. Yo, I rise with Jeezy, but it's not off the South. It's, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're part of the hip hop generation, Mr. Israel. We are hip hop generation, absolutely. Um, right, let it go to Mike, on, Mark. Mr. Ely, right. <laughs> So what I wanted to ask in regards to maybe the last comment about um, extra muscles was um, like, it makes me think of, you know, superiority. Like, so, you know, it's not that I'm saying, okay, justify that or like, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like, it takes it back to the, to the negative or like, what's better, you know, what's, you know, but it takes it back to superiority and authority of uh, the human uh, kind. So, so how, how, no, I'm not saying it as a negative, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to open the discussion to you commenting on the extra muscles and like, I'm trying to figure out how do you stand in front of criticism? How do you, uh, how do you, what's like, how do you punch back? How do you like say, it's not to say better, it's not, it's to say, you know, maybe participation, I don't know. I don't know what exactly the answer is. Yeah, we continue doing homework after graduate school. <laughs> we continue doing research, not just our artwork. I can make artwork and show an exhibit, okay, but have I continued my knowledge base? You know, again, like literally, a year ago, it happens every summer, we still investigate the foundation, the most simplistic, foundation of art and build up from there. And I don't know many artists that still continue that investigation. That how can you still sharpen your tools and still build upon it? And there's, again, there's so much that the world creatives have offered to the world that it would be arrogant of me to ignore that. It'd be, it'd be a, a arrogant for me to ignore who the Wadabi tribe is. Right, the most beautiful people on earth. They consider themselves that. That's what they say. It would be arrogant for me to not know who Thornton Dial is mm. oh and his God. contribution mm. to abstraction. Right. Yeah. yeah, so how do you battle criticism? Yes, knowing that Thornton Dial was better than Rauschenberg. Well, before Rauschenberg. I mean, that's critique of judgment. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, how do you defend yourself is understanding the complete context, not just what's presented in front of you. So, like, so it's not, it, it can come off, I understand. The, the statement, though, can come off as solely only dealing with black artists, African-American artists, right. but it really goes beyond that. It transcends that. And so... It's a, it, it still goes back to being truthful and an investigation in, in, in that and how one can accomplish that. And if one takes the time to investigate the Dogon and the importance of the ceremonies Absolutely. or investigate, you know, what's the, what are the origins of hip hop? I mean, it's, if you really think about it, I'm, I'm going on a tangent, I'm about to smoke school, I'm sorry. But, I mean, it's, it's almost hip hop, yeah, that's right. hip hop, for hip hop, it was something beyond the people that created it for it to exist, right? I mean, like, here we're gonna take some power, take some electricity from power lines. Uh, I wanna continue dancing upright, you know what? I wanna dance down near the ground. Now we have break dance, that evolves into break dancing. We're gonna continue looping this music, now that becomes a break beat. We're gonna, uh, I wanna just talk at the party on the microphone, now that becomes rhyming. It, it, it just seems that that's something beyond itself that's embedded in a group of people that just wanted to say we were here. And now you have something 
that's actually the second largest export out of this country. When at 20 years ago, they're like, it won't exist. So now imagine it, like, like my daughter, who's, I'm still going on, I'm sorry. My, my daughter, who's, who's 13 years old, and I'm really making this personal, I'm not trying to make it sympathetic, but she had no idea the origins of hip hop. She had no idea the origins of break dancing. She thought, she thought hip hop was Macklemore. Mm. Now there's nothing wrong with Macklemore. No, I, I disagree with that. I disagree with that though, right? But because hip hop allowed that to happen. So, but at, but, at the same, but at the same time, she thinks that that's the beginning of hip hop. And that's a problem. And it's happened in the visual arts. Yes, I'm sorry. You got more questions? I know, well, real quick. We believe that that's not okay. That mix up and that, that um, confusion as to what should be placed right historically, that's on us. Come on, man, let me say something else. Go ahead. All right, so, so like, like, like for, for another example, you can, you can take an art appreciation class, right. a, very, a foundation art class, and they will teach you that, you know, the, 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 the aqueduct systems in Rome and da 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 da. Right. Okay, that's great. Busy. That was great. But in, in India, hundreds of years before that, they already, they already had aqueduct systems. They already had, right. it was so evolved that they had levels of. Not AC, but you know, like cooling systems for homes, right. from water running, running through the walls. We're right. not taught that, but right. that's important to learn. That's important to know. And that's important to learn that contribution. It's very important to well, learn that. Question. So there's another question. question. Another question. question. More questions. Discussing. This this is where we do our small school. We disagree. We agree. We <laughs> talk. We discover. One more. We yeah. Continue it over pizza. Yes, yeah. pizza. Yeah. New York pizza. That's what I came here for. <laughs> Outside the talk. This is One great. More question. I love New York pizza. One more question. One more question. Continue out there. I'll keep it quick now that I know the pizza in the way. Pizza and cookies. Well, thank you guys. I don't know, am I hearing myself? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear All right, well, thank you guys very much, and, and lady, for, for what you said. I think what's most important, um, my name is Ray Yano, so I'm an artist that was in that show, not to be mentioned, and uh, <laughs> all of that stuff. That, uh, but that's how we got our introduction here in New York, and then I was fortunate to work with you, not only side by side as an artist, but side by side as a curator, and then we were able to extend that for that show afterwards and, and do some things. And what I really have to say, and, and, and as much as you said it, it's, it's truly the fact that you're a group of individuals that are, you know, you have integrity within your own being and your own focus and your discipline. And then you come together as this collective, honest body about not only your work, but also about your process and everything else. And so even just knowing this already, hearing it and seeing it discussed, for young students and, and, and folks here at, at, at uh, SVA, I thought it was just really great to know from my own personal experience that you practice it. And, uh, and so it was an honor to work with you then, and I know we'll work together again. And it was just a matter of you could speak for others in your collective, you know, and, and, and hold others outside without it being confrontational, you know, and being able to really, you know, as an artist, I know I haven't been the easiest w to work with with the curator. So when I turned around and flipped the hat, and but it was, uh, and that was, it was just a great experience. So I, I thank you all, really. I didn't really have a, a, a question <laughs> <laughs> because, thank but you. I wanted to publicly thank, thank them, and I hope that you guys got as much out of it as I did, even already knowing about them. And I'll shut up now because pizza is waiting. <laughs> majority of us are transplants, right? So, um, yeah, and Atlanta definitely has a style, if you will. So um, we, we were really trying to figure out where we fit in, what, who should we connect with, and all, all of that, right? So the list kind of started out with like 30, 40 people that I would send texts to, hey, we're going to check out this spot tonight, right? And um, after that, we would, you know, smoke a cigar, smoke whatever, and um, we would discuss until probably, 
you know, two, three in the morning, right? Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer. <laughs> in, you know, rain, sleet, or snow. A lot of times yeah. we caught Eric out there real, real cold. It'd be cold. <laughs> <laughs> and we, right? call, we call that holding court. Right. So it would be purely conversation about art, though. Right. So it not not just shucking and jiving, not 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 uh, barbershop talk, none of that kind of stuff. We would be talking high level art, theory and application, yeah. right? So not just um, not just reading, but theory and application, and and that's how it started. It started very informally. It started just we're going to hit these spots, and um, we're going to hit these spots, and then we're going to talk about it. Then it became then it became official, official, if you will, right? Where okay, we're meeting, we're talking every week. What are we going to do about this, right? You and know? it was kind of during the gallery off season. There you go. And we started to implement homework. We started to implement a focus for the group. So outside of just looking at art, when we didn't have the opportunity to look at art, we came up with a topic and we would discuss that topic and relate it sometimes to what we saw that week if we saw anything that week. Absolutely, mandatory homework. Right, so even if the the homework itself didn't necessarily apply to your work, well, how could it? How could it apply to your work? Right, so we're we're literally having very um, <laughs> intimate conversations about your work and the relevancy of it. Right, um, so the homeworks began, <laughs> right, and the homeworks kind of um, well. They, yeah. yeah, they became really important. They became the backbone, backbone of the group. Right. Because the homework kept us intellectual. They kept us relevant to each other. They kept us focused. Because a, a group of people can always come together and lose focus. It's hard to move a group of people. Absolutely. But if we have a homework, then we always have a focus. And Chris is very good at bringing it back to the homework. Always. And usually, usually <laughs> when we come together, you know, we'll talk a little bit. Everybody will get familiar. Right. And then set it off. Who wants to set it off? Who wants to talk about the homework first? And that's when it becomes intellectual. Usually, if it's your first time at Smoke School, you then set it off. you start it off. You spark it. You spark the homework, right? And that's your introduction <laughs> into Smoke yeah, School, yeah. right? And no, we, we really welcome all types of dialogue and really prove your point. That's, that's really, or that's one of the main bases behind Smoke School is prove your point. Um, one of our phrases is talk with your chest. Say it with your chest. Say it with your chest. Right? Nah, don't back down. Collective. 
All right, and we've been around since 2009. And again, we thank you very much for uh, bringing us here. As mentioned before, we're an Atlanta-based nonprofit think tank that discusses and addresses contemporary philosophy and issues of modern art and culture. All right? Here's our, just a little, our mission statement. I'm not gonna read it to you. I'll just take a minute for you to kind of go through it. You know, I am gonna read it to you. <laughs> all right? Now, by the way, you're talking to all scholars up here, you know, and, and as loose as we may seem in our approach to communicating to you what Smoke School is about, you're gonna find a number of you that are a year in, a semester in, you're in your last semester, you're gonna be in an island after you're done, all right? And we've kind of, we'll, we'll address it later on, but at the end of the day, <laughs> this is our mission statement. And I'll get back to what I just stated. Um, and when you do get challenged, we'll give you the time. Take the time you need to, you know, <laughs> argue <laughs> your point. And um, yeah, get it out there. Is that what you want to talk about, the curse words came from? Ah. <laughs> so the curse words came from. <laughs> And the curse words in the presentation. <laughs> in the presentation. Yeah. Came from an evening of, um, a, a matter of fact, Marvin was there that evening. <laughs> he, he, she, technically, he should be on that video as well. Exactly. He, he, he had some choice words for the gentleman as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we was at the goat farm. We were at the goat farm. We were at this large table, and we all meeting, and we are discussing... Um, but this young gentleman came. Hold on one second. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I had a studio in the Gold Farm, which I no longer have because of that conversation. I just <laughs> thought I'd throw it That's true. That's true. And but, <laughs> that's a, that, that is a very important part. We, <laughs> our, our conversation and our dialogue does get shh. We don't stay. Incredibly honest. <laughs> we don't stay in one place very long, except now we're at my place, so. We're good, <laughs> but um, yeah. So that young gentleman had the idea that um, what he should do was he should create artwork that fit the mold of Western art world <laughs> of the Western art world. And after he's made a success for himself, that thirty years later he would magically change and become honest again. By the way, he was African. Yeah, he was from Liberia. He was. He, he, yeah. Uh, a Liberian born and bred guy <laughs> saying this, right? And he'd been ple pleading his case for about an hour and a half. And it really just reached its point of um, really wasting our intellectual dialogue, which we were having uh, about. So anyway, one of the tenets of um, this group is be honest. Be honest. Be honest with your work. Be honest with who you are, what you're trying to say an attempt, any attempt, to try and code and subvert. Not that your work needs to be overt. No, it doesn't need to be overt and in your face. No, but never back down. Never backpedal, never try to make your work fit somewhere and have it, because it's, one is sad. It's sad. You're, you're paying all this money to become a master of art. You should master your art, honestly. So a lot of our um, discussions, when you hear that intensity or that, or that passion, comes from that. Comes from when that is not present. When that honesty isn't present, then yes, you, will, you would hear a lot of expletives. <laughs> <laughs> and make, making money doesn't determine right. how, if someone's honest or not either. You know? So, you know, just, you know, Nike's a good running shoe. That doesn't make them the best running shoe. And I, I believe that honestly, that, that's what they try to do. They try to they lure you with the money, and then you. Here a second ago, but we assert that all modern art derives from Africa. All conceptual exercise is derived and conceived in the ancient ceremonies of the Dogon. We are the noble savages that reside on the moon with rites of passage, shape shifting through the universe. We truly believe and have special powers embedded in our pigment, hair, and bone. We have been indoctrined by grimy hip-hop, and you can handle or you cannot handle our extra muscle. All right? 
And so with that being said, I'm going to kind of go through the founders here. And here are our founders. We have Christopher Hutchinson on the far left, soon to be Dr. Eric Mason in the middle, and Michi Miko, who was, was unable to make it for personal um, obligations on the far right. And uh, with that being said, we'll have, as we'll, we're going to get into smoke school, but we'll have each individual here on the panel introduce themselves and talk about their work. And this is uh, Christopher Hutchinson. Hey. Uh, thank you for having us once again. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, the collective um, started in 2009 with myself. Eric Mason, Michi Miko, and you know, it did start as a response to being after graduate school. And yes, after graduate school, you will, you will miss it. You will miss the intellectual discourse and debate between your classmates. You will need to further that, right? Um, so. We can go more on that. You miss access. So yeah. after postgraduate school, access to your <coughs> colleagues, access to equipment, access to a critique, access to an opinion. It, it's tough, and you actually have access to a deadline. I mean, some of you may get gallery representation, some of you may have an opportunity to do shows, but still, th those grades push those deadlines. Those professors push those deadlines, so those expectations change. And as an artist, I began to change because I didn't have those expectations. Right, I mean, so it started with, it started with one, searching out and finding out you know what truly atlanta has to offer so myself eric and um, michi every friday we would go to every gallery that was posted we and called it we called it hidden spots hidden spots so we would go hit all the <laughs> spots that had art exactly and you know i would text pretty much everybody that that i knew as an artist let's go check out this space is this space relevant you know is the work good Right. And then we'd have a conversation about the work. Exactly. What would you like tonight? What did you see tonight? It's similar to a critique. So when you guys put your work on the wall or you show a video or you have a sculpture, you ask your colleagues, what do you think? What do you think of the work? Right. So we, we would do a critique every Friday on what we saw in, in local Atlanta or wherever we traveled to. Right. And, you know, whether or not our work fit in that space. Right. And a lot of, even though we are an Atlanta-based collective, It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Smoke School of Art, an Atlanta-based nonprofit think tank and artist collective that addresses contemporary issues in art, culture, and philosophy. Smoke School builds communities through exhibitions, partnerships, lectures, critiques, and educational development. Established in 2009, Smoke School has exhibited at venues such as uh, Pinion Gallery in Miami, Tubman African American Museum in Georgia, Bariqua College in New York, the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta, and the, under, and, under, and the Underground in Atlanta. Smoke School also acts as a catalyst for post-formal schooling for artists where participation is free and open to the public, homework is given through social media, and classes held in weekly Friday night meetings. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Hitchinson, Eric Mason, Karina May, Julio Mejia, Michi Miko, Jason Sweet, and Jamel Wright Sr. of the Smoke School of Art. We want to applaud you because you brought us here. So a Smoke School, we say thank you to you. You guys did a wonderful job of selecting a fantastic collective. <laughs> Welcome back to Moving the Center. As always, I'm your host, Carly Asset. Thanks for staying with us. In collaboration with the Smoke School of Art, a nonprofit art collective based in Atlanta, the Auburn Avenue Research Library recently hosted an engaging community lecture series on black art in America. In the last installment of the series, conceptual artist and educator Christopher Hutchinson examined some of the ways that racism manifests in the making and marketing of black art. Uh, 
hopefully this is an ongoing kind of partnership between this institution and this group. Um, so I want to mention that. Um, also, um, what was the other thing I was going to mention? Permanent collection. Oh, yeah. <laughs>